We're turning to Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Just planning to focus on the first verse tonight for a little while. Reading at verse 1 then. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Notice the title first of all. It is a song of degrees for Solomon. A song of degrees for Solomon. Now there are 15 songs of degrees in our Bible. They begin at Psalm 120 and they go on to Psalm 134, 15 in all. And this is the central psalm. This is the eighth psalm of the Psalms of Degrees. Now, uh, I don't know whether you know much about these, but I looked up in the in, uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, and there are two views that there that seem to me plausible as to what these mean. And so it says there in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, quote, the most probable view is that the hymns were sung by pilgrim bands on their way to the three great festivals of the Jewish year. The journey to Jerusalem was called a going up, where the worship came from north or south or east or west. All of the songs are suitable for use on such occasion. Hence the title Pilgrim Psalms is preferred by many scholars. There's another uh, definition which is the ancient Jewish view which to my mind is just as probable. Uh, and I'll, I won't quote here but I've just made some notes on it there was a staircase in the temple apparently semicircular, which comprised 15 steps and that is the same as the number of the Psalms of Degrees and then you remember in the book of Isaiah when, Hez when, Isaiah, when Hezekiah recovers from his sickness uh, Hezekiah is told that in confirmation of the Lord's word to him the sun would return 10 degrees on the dial of Ahaz now the word, the Hebrew word translated dial can also mean a stair or a step. So the Jewish men believed that this was a reference to that half, half circular staircase and the sun would move 10 degrees, it would be one step on the staircase. Um, so 10 degrees backwards as the, as the sun was to move the, the, would mean the shadow would back up the stairs 10 steps. Uh, the, the Jews believed that the uh, the sun cast a shadow or something in some object cast a shadow on these steps and that shadow when the dial went back when the sun went back went up the steps by 10 and this was in the temple um, and they also say that the Levites on the various occasions used to stand on different steps um, of that staircase and so this could be also a reference uh, to the song of degrees that the, the, the uh, the staircase. As I say, the word degree is also translated stair and step, or you could translate it stair and step from the Hebrew. So it could be the pilgrims approaching Jerusalem or in connection with the staircase in the temple. Now the psalm is also called a song of degrees for Solomon. And there are those that say that Solomon wrote it. One man says it was King Hezekiah who later included it in the book of Psalms. Uh, and maybe in the, on a future day, perhaps, I don't know, we might come back to that thought. Others say that David wrote it for Solomon. David, of course, was Solomon's father. And David was the author, as you know, of many of the, many of the Psalms. So there are others that say that David wrote it for Solomon. It might also, as some say, have relevance to, the, to Solomon building the temple. Uh, Hence it begins, except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain to build it. You know, David left all the plans with Solomon and Solomon built the temple. Someone has described the intent or teaching of the whole psalm saying, God builds, furnishes, 
enriches and defends a house during sleep without human help. And the house in this in this psalm can be a building uh, or it can be children. Uh, the primary lesson then here and throughout the psalm is the vanity that is the uselessness and the unprofitableness of everything a man does if he does not first consult the Lord. And the house in this psalm, as I say, pictures a number of things. It might picture Solomon's temple, this particular house that's referred to. It certainly pictures the church, and we should be drawing some lessons from that. And it also pictures the birth and the raising of children. A home in the Bible, uh, sorry, a house in the Bible sometimes means a family. If you look with me at Hebrews 11, 7, a house sometimes means a family. Hebrews 11, 7. Easy enough to find right at the back of your Bible. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. That's got nothing to do with bricks and mortar. That's his three children, Shem, Ham, Japheth, his wife, and their wives. So the house here is his family. Um, got another reference to it somewhere. Yes, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. And verse 9. Deuteronomy 25 and verse 9. Then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. So a house can be a building, it can be a family, and in Psalm 127 it's both of those things. I might perhaps say more, I don't know yet whether we'll continue here next week, but if we do I might say more about Solomon's temple. Uh, but what I ask first is can this, what can this verse teach us about the church? This first verse, except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. What, what does this teach us about the church? Remember what the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 18, answering Peter, he said, I will build my church, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, collectively we are called the, we are called the church, but we're also the body of Christ, and we're each of us members. We're the bride of Christ, and it's true to say that I am the bride of Christ, Chris is the bride of Christ. It's not just a collective thing because the bride is made up of all the individual saints just as the body is made up of those individual parts. So it's a lovely thought to think that I, as the bride of Christ, will be built up. I will build my church. And you can't build the church without looking after you and I. So we will build, he will bless you and I. Have a look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Paul says to the Ephesian elders, just departing from them, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. We sometimes talk about buildings as edifices. A building is an edifice. And our King James Bible use the word a lot to edify one another, to build one another up. So when the Lord Jesus says, I will build my church, thank God he means, he means me. And he means you, and he means you, and he means, he means it, I will build my church. He can't build that church without building every one of us. He would not neglect a one of us. We all belong to him. We are all part of the bride of Christ. And therefore, individually, we can say, I can say, I am the bride of Christ. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, right to the Ephesians, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it 
with a washing of water by the word. And that's each one of us. That's a lovely thought, I think. Also, when the Lord Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, that's a great comfort to those who are in leadership in churches. Some of them, sadly, and I hope I'm not among them, not that I'm the leader, but I do most of the preaching, don't I? Um, feel that the church stands or falls by their ministry. No, it doesn't. I will build my church, says the Saviour. And it's a great comfort to me to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is building Hellier Street. The Lord Jesus Christ is building each one of us. And if I had a heart attack tomorrow, he could still look after this church. He could do it. He'd bring somebody in tomorrow night. Uh, I will build my church. It's his church. So we need not be afraid of, of, of uh, threats from others. We need not be afraid, as many were during the COVID so-called pandemic. Uh, the Lord is able to take care of us. And uh, as I, I feel a measure of responsibility, though it's not official, it's uh, de facto rather than de jure, um, I thank God that he's in charge of the, the Lord Jesus is in charge of his church. And if somebody was to threaten me and, and you know want to get me out of here, they've got to get past Jesus. <laughs> and I thank God for that. They've got to get past the Lord because it's his church. I don't mind if it's the Lord's will and I've got to go, that's okay. But they've got to get past him. And uh, that takes them doing. We've had people in the past cause trouble and they've gone. Thank God they've gone. So the Lord Jesus watches over his assembly even when the leaders get things wrong. And I can commit this work into his hands, as can you. Though I have many shortcomings, he loves his people and the assemblies of the saints are his first concern. How sad that so many now in our country don't have this kind of burden to see their churches open and thriving. How sad and what a reflection upon the state of the church that they all closed down with alacrity when Boris Johnson gave the word. Now, we, it's true, we closed down at first. We gave him the benefit of the doubt at first. But as a few week, weeks went by, there came a smell from number 10, in my view. There came a smell from the Houses of Commons, in my view. And I thought, no, we should open the doors. When they begin to tell us, you can't sing, and you've got to cover your face in church, all contrary to the word of God, uh, we came back. We came back well before, I, I, I put all this on record, somebody will come after me, we came back before most of the churches. It goes on to talk, and uh, I don't know, it's the verse I want to handle. Uh, he giveth his beloved sleep. Uh, for reasons you well know. Uh, I've been struggling to try and get some peace and joy of that, but I'm still struggling with getting peace and joy of that. But sleep is of the Lord. I'll just say that in passing. When we get to around about chapter 5 of Esther, the king couldn't sleep that night, could not the king sleep. The Lord took his sleep away because he's got a work to do, powerful and important work to do. And uh, at least as far as the care of the church is concerned, if I could sleep, I could sleep on that count uh, because it's his church. Now I want to read you uh, from John Phillips uh, concerning the building of the church. Just a brief paragraph. Um, what he has to say about building the church if the Lord build not the house they labour in vain that build it the, this truth, the truth applies to us as much as to Solomon it applies to every local church and assembly to every effort made down here to build God's house that great habitation of God through the spirit it is not going to be built by super programs by slick advertising by TV commercials, it's not going to be built by oratory in the pulpit or by excellence in the choir. It's not going to be built by high pressure evangelism, by vast sums of money, by well organized missions. It's going to be built by the Holy Spirit, by Christ living in and through believers. Now the church in the New Testament is likened uh, both to a temple and to a family. Uh, as, as we find the building in this psalm. Uh, look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 
The church in the New Testament is likened both to a temple and to a family. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So we're a building. We're a temple. But we're also a family. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 29. Romans 8. Verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're a family. John in his epistle speaks to those that he writes to as a family. He talks to your fathers, your sons, you little children. So the testimony of the Bible throughout is that men, including the church, can do nothing without God which is what this psalm is underlining. What did the Lord Jesus say in John 15, 5? John 15, 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. What does Paul say? We just looked at 1 Corinthians 3. Let's go back there again. 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the builder of the church. He alone is the builder of the church. And he's the foundation of the church. And Zechariah chapter 4. I was, uh, Jean and I used to watch University Challenge. And uh, the man who is in charge of it is a bit of an intellectual. But I had to chuckle when they had a Bible question one night and he referred to this book as Zechariah. <laughs> Just shows the ignorance of the Bible. Here's a man, very intelligent, picked for his intelligence to host University Challenge and he calls Zechariah Zechariah. Well, there you go. Um, verse 4 of Zechariah chapter 4 sorry verse 6 of Zechariah chapter 4 then he answered and spake unto me saying this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts and this of course Zechariah is prophesying at the rebuilding of the temple after the return from Babylonian captivity there's been a kind of hiatus there's been a break in the building because of the enemies of the Jews the adversaries they wrote to Cambyses Cambyses got the building work stopped and the Lord sent Zechariah and Haggai to get the building work started again and it's there to Zerubbabel one of these uh, princes well I think he was the governor and the Lord says in this word saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord that's just as true today as it was when it was said to the Romabal. So the first thing I learned from these thoughts about without me you can do nothing is that we'll be wise to ask the Lord's guidance for our lives from day to day. Benjamin Franklin, I think he was a president, wasn't he, at some time in the States, uh, gave a very encouraging speech at the founding, the creating of the US Constitution. They tell me it's based upon our Magna Carta. And although modern presidents vow to keep it, they couldn't care less about it, is the fact of the matter. 
But Benjamin Franklin had a, he made a wonderful speech. Um, might take me a moment to find it. He made a wonderful speech to the convention that was gathered, I believe, to draft the Constitution. And uh, this is what he said. We'll get there eventually. Except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain the building. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for the divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favour. To that kind providence we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future na national felicity. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived for a long time, 81 years. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that, except the Lord build the house, they labour in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring we shall proceed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interests, our prospects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing government by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war or conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business and that one or more of the clergy of this city be requested to officiate in that service. Wouldn't it be great if Boris Johnson spoke like that? Wouldn't it be great if there was the same kind of resolve amongst our MPs that the word of God, that, that prayer should be made uh, for the profiting of their work? But alas, I don't think we're going to see it. I think we might all be surprised how much more smoothly would go even the small things of the day if we offered up a prayer first. We assume far too much, we take far too much for granted. And as for great matters, of course, prayer is essential. The second thing I learned from the verses I quoted a moment ago about doing nothing without the Lord Jesus is that we can never boast. However much we might feel the situation has blossomed because of us, we should be most careful about pride. Whatever we feel we may have accomplished, it could not have been done without his blessing. First his guidance, and then his power. As with our salvation, so with our service. We could not do one thing to save ourselves. We are all to Jesus' death for us. Neither can we do anything in his service. Whatever we do for him can only be done by him, working in and through us, so that he alone is glorified. Philippians chapter 2. Whatever we do for him can only be done by him, working in and through us, so that he alone is glorified. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. That's an encouraging verse. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. verses 20 and 21 <clears throat> now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep 
through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. We do the work that God wants us to do through his spirit that dwells in us. And if we're not working in that way, we're not working. Our, our works will be burned up at the judgment seat, as we read in 1 Corinthians 3. So it's foolishness to build without him. Uh, he teaches us this also in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. It's foolishness to build without the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 7. Here we learn that his guidance is given in his word and we build in vain if we disobey or ignore it. Matthew 7 verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Except the Lord build the house. They labour in vain that build it. The two men themselves that the Lord speaks of here we might think were alone responsible for these buildings but it's the Lord who builds by his word or by its neglect does not. The difference here is the word of the Lord and attention and obedience to that word. How much more effective for Christ I would be if I found more time to meditate upon his words. And I'm sure we could all say amen to that. So, amen. Amen.